PV work gonna be the topic of this lesson and that's short for pressure volume work. And this is a topic we introduced in the last lesson on the first law of thermodynamics. The most common type of work we would cover is this pressure volume work. Uh, but we paid it lip service and we didn't go too heavy into it. Uh, and that's because many of you don't need to go any further into it than that. But if it was a point of emphasis in your class, especially oftentimes if you're a chemistry major, then it is usually something that's expounded upon a little bit more than I did in the last lesson. And that's what we're gonna cover here. And specifically calculations involving work, if you wanna add Q and W, uh, oftentimes you're going to be doing this in joules. And the problem is, is that work is not going to come out in joules if you use the standard units of pressure and volume that you're often given. Pressure in atmospheres and volume in liters. An atmosphere liter is not the same thing as a joule, and you're going to be trying to add apples and oranges if you're trying to add Q and W in that case. So uh, we'll finish this lesson off by showing you how to convert from those units into units that are going to uh, lead you down the path of joules, and we'll show a couple different ways to do that. Uh, but that's kind of the main point of this lesson. My name is Chad and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. This lesson's part of my new general chemistry playlist. I'm releasing several a week throughout the school year. So if you wanna be notified every time I post one, subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification. Now, in addition to high school and college science prep, we also do MCAT, DAT, and OAT prep. You can check out those courses at chadsprep.com. Let's get into this. All right, so we gotta talk about work a little bit here, and we're gonna talk about this in a little bit of a physics context as well, so be prepared. So if you've had physics, this will make a little more sense initially, but I won't go too far down the rabbit hole or anything. So uh, we're gonna take a look at a, a gas and a piston. And this is gonna be a lovely cylindrical, uh, in a cylinder, I should really say, with a piston pushing down on it. And in this case, you should know that the standard definition for work is force times displacement. And you might see displacement written as like delta x or something like that. I'm just gonna write it as f times d, uh, force times displacement. That's what we're gonna use as our working definition for work in this case. And it comes out in units of joules. And so the question is, why are we allowed to use work as being pressure times volume? And, and it turns out that work is actually equal to the change in PV. That's actually the working definition of work uh, in terms of pressure volume. The problem is, is that if you actually want to solve for work, it's probably going to involve a little bit of calculus and solving for like the area under a curve and taking an integral. And uh, that's not very fun. And so oftentimes we just say, we're only going to have general chemistry students calculate work under constant external pressure, which is why it reduces to this lovely equation, which doesn't involve taking an integral. And that's why it's nice. Um, so most of you aren't going to be on the hook for any kind of PV work, just PV work at constant external pressure, FYI. All right, so we're gonna push down on this piston. And in this case, we're gonna push it down until it's moved a certain distance or displacement down. So, and in this case, we'll have moved it down a displacement D. And we'll have done that under a constant force here to push this piston down. And so this force times this displacement would get us the work. And we're gonna see how actually this delta PV ends up being the same thing, or really more specifically how this formula, because we're gonna do this under constant force, which means we're doing it under constant uh, pressure as well, as it turns out. And so if we take a look at this, your change in volume here, well, if we look, the change in volume is the volume of a cylinder with this height right here. And you might recall, that your volume of a cylinder is equal to the cross-sectional area, which is the area of a circle, pi r squared, times the height of that cylinder. And in this case, we don't actually have to write it as pi r squared times h. We're just gonna write it as the cross-sectional area. We don't have to worry about it that it is the area of a circle in this particular example, but times h. And what's nice though, is that in this case, the delta v is related to the delta, the change in displacement here. And so really what I'm gonna do is make this a delta v, and then instead of the height here, I'm gonna make it, just to make the variables the same, a d, the displacement, because that is the height. So that corresponds to the change in volume of that gas. Okay, so that's our delta v. So, and then your definition of pressure, is force per unit area. We'll see this again in a chapter on gases down the road. And so all of a sudden now we can see that uh, pressure times delta V, F over A times A over D. Let's write this out. So F over A times A D and the A's cancel and you're just left with F D. So force times displacement and it's got some sort of equivalent expression. Notice I didn't worry about the negative here and stuff like that and we'll worry about signs in a little bit and stuff like that. But you can see now why uh, pressure volume work is indeed work and does have units of joules. All right, so I wanted to get through that little derivation real quick. And now we've got some other things to worry about here. And so one of them is some sort of graphical representation here where we get pressure on the y-axis, 
volume on the x-axis. And again, we're only gonna consider constant pressure. So we're gonna have graphs that look like this. And maybe we've got some initial point here and some final point here. And in this case, if that's the case, then our volume is increasing. And when your volume is increasing, that's when you're gonna calculate negative work. So whereas if we'd been going the other direction where this was the initial point and then some smaller volume, the final point, that would have been a compression. And that's when work comes out positive. You might recall from the last lesson. So that's how you might predict your signs. But the big thing here, as long as this is zero on the pressure scale here, working its way up. So it turns out that the area under the curve is how you could also calculate the work in this case, because it's pressure times volume or delta PV and things of this sort. Uh, and so in this case, that area under the curve is work. And in this case, just the area of a rectangle, it's nice. But notice if you were given a graph like this, you might not even have to worry about just constant pressure. You could be given one at certain angles and stuff like that and have to calculate the area of a triangle, one half base times height or something like this. So however, in a formal calculation, you're probably only gonna be dealing with constant external pressure, something that would end up looking like this. So maybe you'll see this graphically, maybe you won't. Maybe you'll have to do some calculations graphically and realize that work is indeed the area under the curve on a PV graph here. All right, so now let's go back to uh, calculating work. And let's say you're given, you know, first off that, let's say you're given that Q is something like 100 joules. So in this case, that means that the uh, heat was transferred from the, some, from the surroundings into the system. And in this case, typically 100 joules of heat. And then you're told that this gas at a constant external pressure of one atmosphere expanded by two liters. Okay. Well, in this case, because it's an expansion, you know that work is gonna be negative. The question is, what's the value? And you might be tempted to be like, well, Chad told me it's one atmosphere. And then times, it got increased by two liters, and then we'll put the negative sign out front. And you're like, great. So one times two is two, and then you're like, minus two except it's not a joule. Right now it's a liter atmosphere and that is by no means the same thing as a joule. So you've got to convert these liter atmospheres into joules and there's two ways to pull that off. Now a joule is the SI unit for energy. And so in this case, if you use all SI units for pressure and volume, it will come out to the SI unit of joules. And so it turns out the SI unit for pressure is the Pascal and the SI unit for volume is the meter cubed. And so if we convert both of these to Pascals and meters cubed respectively, we could then have an answer that comes out in joules and then be prepared to go this route. And so in this case, if we've got one atmosphere and it turns out the conversion here is one atmosphere is 101,325 pascals and one times 101,325 is 101,325 pascals. So in this case, because it was one atmosphere, we just have the conversion. All right. So that gets us to pascals. And then for liters, we've got two liters and it turns out there are a thousand liters in one meter cubed. It's not like a special, you know, metric conversion power of 10 you should have known or anything like this. This is oftentimes something you could look up in a table or something you might be provided, but uh, 1000 liters is equal to one meter cubed. Uh, and so in this case, we'll f find that two divided by a thousand is just 0 0.002 meters cubed. Cool. And now we've got a pressure in Pascals and this guy in meters cubed, the volume change. And now we could plug those in and calculate them back here. And so in this case, this is really going to come out to negative P, which again is 101.325 Pascals times delta V, which in this case is 0 0.002 meters cubed. And it turns out a Pascal meter cubed is indeed the same thing as a joule. And so here we'd pull out our handy dandy calculator. And so we can go 101.325 times 0 0.002. And we're going to get 202.65. In that case, that is indeed negative. So we'd have work equals negative 202.65 joules. And so now we could insert that back in here in the proper units. And we'd find out that 100 minus 202.65 is going to be negative 102.65 for the change in internal energy. And I'm not worried about sig figs here at all, FYI. 
Okay, so this is one way of getting your work in joules when the pressure has been provided in atmospheres and the volume in, or at least the volume change in liters. So, but it's not the only way. And this one's a little bit of a pain in the butt because students don't often have to actually convert between atmospheres and pascals or between meters cubed and liters, although that one might be just a little more common, but not much. And so a lot of students really struggle with this conversion. So you got one other route you can really go here and we're gonna need some room. And this is gonna involve the universal gas constant. So universal gas constant, which we'll cover in chapter 10 on gases. So R here is either 0 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin, or it's often provided as 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. And so it turns out our, this universal gas constant can be expressed in a whole host of units. And if you were taking a more advanced thermodynamic class, we might show you 10 different values for R's expressed in different units, and it's a huge pain in the butt. Uh, however, for most general chemistry students, it is specifically just these two values that are provided. And we find out that when you're dealing with gases and the ideal gas law in chapter 10, which we'll get to much later, but PV equals NRT, almost always you're gonna use this one. And there's one other place in the equilibrium chapter uh, when we deal with equilibrium constants that you might use this value. But in all things concerning energy, we often use this value as well instead because it's in joules, the SI unit for energy, instead of the liter atmosphere. But the big thing is this, if you have both of these values of R provided, and for a lot of students, they'll have it like on the back page of their exam in a big table of constants. And if you've always got them available, then what you must realize here, notice they've got moles, Kelvin and the denominator, uh, uh, both alike, and so it's the joules and liter atmospheres. And so for these to both equal the universal gas constant, well then 0 0.08206 liter atmospheres must equal 8.314 joules. And because we now have an equivalence between liter atmospheres and joules, we could use this as a conversion factor. And so if you recall, we said way back up here, we were gonna have negative two times one liter atmospheres. Well, if we take that negative two liter atmospheres, let's do it right here. So, and then from here, we could take and put the liter atmospheres. We need a little more room there, my bad. Put the liter atmospheres in the denominator for dimensional analysis, make the units cancel. We'll put the joules in the numerator. And again, 8.314 joules is equal to 0 0.08206. Sometimes that's shortened down to 0 0.0821 FYI. Uh, and now we're just using it as a conversion factor. The liter atmospheres will cancel and this will get converted to joules. And lo and behold, if we've done this correctly, we should get this same answer for work here. And so if we take negative two times 8.314, divided by 0 0.08206, indeed we get negative 202.63. So I rounded somewhere along the way, but it's exactly the same thing essentially, up to a certain number of sig figs anyways, uh, and another route to come about getting it. So some of you will prefer converting the atmospheres to pascals and the liters to meters cubed. Some of you prefer just doing one conversion, especially if you're of the sort uh, that you've got these two values of R given on your standard list of constants that maybe you get access to on an exam. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, consider giving me a like. Best thing you can do to make sure YouTube shares this lesson with other students. And if you're looking for practice problems on general chemistry, if you're looking for the study guides, if you are looking for practice tests, practice final exams, final exam rapid reviews, then check out my general chemistry master course at chadsprep.com. I'll leave a link in the description. A free trial is available. Happy studying.